Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome back to the Yibana Beit Midrash. Welcome home to Torah. A warm welcome to Torah. And we use the clear car here as the outline for our discussion. Um, I encourage you to learn Hebrew. The source sheets, you won't get color, color, beautiful colored sheets like I have here. But at least on the website, there's a link below. And you can follow along with, which I strongly encourage you to do. And of course, those in the class get hard copy sheets so they can watch they can uh, learn and pay attention as we go along we're in Parshas Masse now I wanted to give like a little bit of an introduction to some of the ideas here that number one number one how, would, how do we stay this because we're going to go a little out of order we like to stay in order but I'm going to give a very brief introduction um, so there are 42 journeys, there are 42 encampments. And one of the biggest, let's say, misunderstood points about the Jewish people is that, and as growing up not religious, we, we make jokes like the Jews got lost in the desert, you know, they were afraid to ask directions, who knows, you can make all kinds of jokes you want, but the truth is they weren't lost. They were wandering, but they weren't wandering in the way that you would look up the, in the dictionary for wandering. Wandering seems aimlessly. There was nothing aimlessly about what they did. <clears throat> there was a point to every time they moved, and there was a reason for every time they stopped, and it was only al -pi Hashem. In other words, when God told them to move, they moved, and they went in the direction and to the place that God wanted them to move to. Now, just as a background, so in the first year alone, they went, to eight um, they went to 14 different places in the first year, which is even less than a year. We're talking about the first uh, 40, 50 days, right? But within the first year, really within the first 50 days, they went to 14 different places. And in the last year, you know, at the 40th year, I don't know if you want to count that way, the, the 39th year, the 40th year, they went to eight places. Now, in between... You have 38 years. They were only at 20 places. And, do, and those 20 places, one of them, they were in one place for 28 years. They weren't aimlessly walking around. They weren't lost. Wherever they moved, it was al -pi Hashem, according to the word of God. I want to get that across. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, because if somebody does commit, we'll call it manslaughter, right? Someone commits an inadvertent murder. In other words, it wasn't premeditated. It was... It wasn't accidental either. It was some negligence involved. There are going to be, there actually are 48 Levitical cities, but there are 42 specific Levitical cities, and then there's six major uh, Levitical cities, so altogether there's 48, but significantly there's 42. Remember, I mentioned there's 42 stations that we tra traversed in the desert, and that's what's listed in our Parsha. And so, I think that it's very significant because also the 42 cities, the, the idea of Levitical, the, the idea of inadvertent killing and having to go to a, a, um, a city of refuge, a miklat. And another idea, oh, let me just mention that those 42 cities, interestingly, as I mentioned, they're, they're for, um, that's where the Levites, Le Levites reside. And when I say Levites, including the Kohanim, and then there are six additional cities, major cities of refuge. Three of them are on this side of the Jordan, in what we call Israel proper. I don't know if that's the term. And then you have three in Aver Hayardain, which is also Israel, but it's on the other side of the Jordan. It's called Israel proper in my, in my mind, but okay. <clears throat> there is a prophecy that there will be an additional three cities. Remember, there's a concept that when Mashiach comes, the era of the Messiah that the holiness of Yerushalayim will spread through all of Eretz Israel, so Israel will have the Kedusha of Yerushalayim, and all of Israel will actually spread through the entire world. So there's an additional three cities, I don't know where, but not in Israel, and probably not in, in the Jordan, or I mean, Avery Yardin, 
but somewhere else in the world for these if there's a inadvertent um, killing. Another idea behind the number 42 is how many words are there in the Shema. Now, not counting the first verse, but the first paragraph, there are 42 words, and the first verse, there are six. So they, in a sense, parallel these 42, as we're going to talk about, these 42 um, uh, encampments, or let's say stages. So in the Sifre Kodesh, in the Holy Svarim, they mention that every human being goes through 42 stages in their life. Okay, so it's not just individual, it's also national. But at least, right, in this part, it's national. But in terms of a human being going through different stages, it's progress. Life is about growth and moving from one stage to the next, keeping that in mind. And then, as I mentioned about the Shema, the Shema is where we really connect with Hashem in a certain sense, as we'll see also, the Levit Levitical, Levitical cities, where one goes if they are, I'm going to call it punishment, but that's not really what's happening here. When somebody inadvertently kills, it means they were negligent and they need to learn how to be more responsible, and therefore they're forced, so to speak, to live amongst Torah scholars so they can learn how to be a more moral person and take responsibility. That's the ultimate goal. There's actually another important point, and it also falls in the Parsha, and that is the death of Arna Cohen. No one, nowhere in the entire Torah do you find the exact day. You can figure it out through logic, or you can figure it out through certain sequence of the verses. But the actual date, the only date of whoever passed away, in the whole Tanakh, in the um, in the five books of Moses, is Aaron Cohen in this week's parsha, and by the way, when someone goes through this process of inadvertently killing and having to be, let's say, held up, right, in a Levitical city, they will go free when the Cohen Guttle dies, and it's there's like seemingly no coincidence here that in our parsha, and not only is it in our parsha, but it has to be tonight. The date given is the first day of the fifth month. Okay, so that is Rosh Chodesh Av. And that's Aaron Kohen, the high priest's uh, yard site. Yard site, for those who don't know what it means, the anniversary of the death. Okay, so that was just like a, a brief introduction. So let's go into the nitty-gritty Hebrew, where it says in chapter 33 of Numbers, verse 1. For those on the English sheets, it's number 1. And I, highlight, I highlighted the Reishi Tevos of the words Ela Masei B'nei Israel. Why did I do that? Let me finish reading and I'll tell you why. I share Yatsu Me Eretz Mitzrayim L'Savotam V'yad Moshe V'yaron. So these are the journeys of the children of Israel who left the land of Egypt in their legions under the charge of Moshe and Aaron. I highlighted it because the Aleph, the Mem, the Bet, and the Yud are the acronym, are the, um, that's what we say, Reishi Tevos, the first letter of these words, symbolize the four machiyut, our own exile as a nation. And the truth is, perhaps this also relates to the individual going through the different stages, hopefully leaving our own Mitzrayim, right? That's, we should all leave our own Mitzrayim and eventually come to the land of Israel uh, and have a intimate relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the Aleph of Ela is for Edom. The Mem of Masse is Media or Persia. It's in other words, that's always the interchangeable name. The Bet for Bavel, B'nai Israel. Ba the Bet is Bavel, Babylon. The Yud in, in the name of Israel would represent Yavan, uh, Greece. Okay, so the first thing is that the Kliakar is interested in knowing this. We already talked about it. You may think that the Jewish people just wandered aimlessly, and there's no, there's, um, there's actually a reason why people would think that way. Because in last week's Parsha, when Moshe spoke to the children of Reuven and Gad, he actually said these words. If you go back to chapter 32, verse 13, it says like this. The Moshe Amr Lamala, Moses spoke to them in chapter 32. 
verse 13, not right, 32, 13. El Ga, El He spoke to them and he said, look at number two, uh, number three. The anger of the Lord flared against Israel, and he made them wander in the desert for 40 years. So in Hebrew, that does give a, a sense that they wandered aimlessly. So there is an excuse for those who, who think that. But our Parsha is coming to dispel that idea, to, to remove that idea. Listen to the way the clear car expresses it. <clears throat> you might have thought, right? It might have come upon your mind to say that they were actually just wandering aimlessly. And you know, he brings a verse that just, it, it just, it's a poetic usage for someone who is moving around without any real direction. And that's from Proverbs chapter 23, verse 34, where it says, and you shall be like one lying in the midst of the sea and one lying at the top of a mast. Now, I'm not a real um, you know, uh, boat goer myself, but I guess the higher the mast, the more nauseous you'll become. I'm just using my imagination. I'm sure people get seasick no matter what. But uh, when you're, you know what I mean? I'm just using my imagination that the higher you are off the, 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 the seabed, when I see this, the, the surface of the ocean, you're rocking even further. Uh, uh, uh. So that's, that's the idea. And <clears throat> so, lo shakatu velo nachu kol arvaim shana. So this is what you might have think. When, whenever the term is salka daitachamina, it means mistakenly thought. You might have thought to say mistakenly <clears throat> that there was no quiet and there was no rest the entire 40 years. Al Kain Amar, that's why the Torah goes out of its way in our Parsha by saying, Elamase. These are the journeys. The journey. There were specific journeys to tell you what? Lomar Lacha. Shiba Arbaim Shana Lo Haniam Kiim Membet Tnuot. That the truth is, during those 40 years, they only traveled 42 travels. And not only that, ubezem miyushav mashinemar. This actually resolves miyushav, responds and resolves what, or settles what it actually says by saying ela mase. It says these are the journeys, and you know what it doesn't say? What maybe you would have expected it to say, because the list is of forty-two two encampments. You have a list of forty-two encampments. It says it doesn't say ela chaniot. Asher Hanu. These are the encampments in which they encamped. It doesn't. But rather, you go through verse 5 all the way to verse 37, where the list is made, and it's a consistent statement. They traveled and they encamped. They traveled and they encamped. So we know they encamped. The whole list is where they encamped. But the truth is where they traveled from and where they traveled to is also listed. So these are the journeys. The journeys had purpose. And it's actually coming to answer up what he, the clear car originally said. You might have had a Havimina, you might have thought to say, it's coming to answer up what we said earlier in chapter 32, verse 13, where it says, midbar that they were just wandering about the desert. Kihatanua, the whole idea of traveling is Hamasos. In other words, the movements were their travelings. Vitam the Sipur Kolamasos, and the, now this is a, a fundamental idea. The reason for either counting or telling over the story about each one of the journeys, you know what Rashi says? Look at Rashi on that. I'm, I'm talking about source number one, the very top few lines. Why were the journeys recorded? To inform us of the kind deeds of the omnipresent. That we weren't just wandering around. That there was man and there was water. There was food in the desert. That he took care of us. That he protected us. That he killed the scorpions and the snakes on our way. And he flattened out the, the roads. <coughs> and, just the, the, and he gave us the Torah. Right? I mean, all the things that we're so grateful for. And the wars that we won. Okay? Now, you, what you should not say... You should not say they were moving about, wandering from station to station for all 40 years. Even in our own lives, we are going through these stages too, and everything in our lives has meaning. We just have to figure it out. 
meditation can help, having a Rebbe, having a good friend, having maybe a therapist, who knows? But, you know, everything has meaning. Okay, so let's go on. Um, the, the last line I'll just read, but he basically says, and it's interesting that the, the Rambam in the Mar Nevuchim gives a different reason for this, and the Abarbanel, which I'm sure is fascinating, gives several reasons for this, but he's not going to go into it. So this is just like an introduction. We're just sk sk uh, skimming the surface here, and now we're going to get into the nitty gritty. Okay, so now we're going to move to verse Bet, the second verse, and this is where we're going to get into what the Kliakar will describe three reasons behind what we're going to question. We have first come with the question and he's going to give three ways to look at different ways to answer it. So in verse 2, you'll find this on number 5 on the source sheet. The Yichtov Moshe et Motsayehim Lama'asem Ap Yashem That's how the verse begins. Moses wrote down, he recorded. Now, the word Motsayehim means from their going out. Uh, this translation says from their starting points, right? To their journeys. Okay, starting points for their journeys. Al Piyashem. All their journeys actually are Piyashem. Question is, why is the second part of the verse in reverse order and it doesn't say Al Piyashem? What's the next part of the verse? The elu maasehem lemotzayehem, and then these, in other words, they're going to be these journeys that Moses wrote from their starting points or the place they went out from towards their journey. That's literally what it said, al piyashem, and then there are these journeys. How would you want to say it? To their starting point. Now you probably never noticed that in the English. And if you did, call it kavod. But the Kleda car is, is pointing out to us. And not only that, he mentions the second part. It doesn't seem to be al pi Hashem because al pi Hashem is not written. But we do know that they only moved according to God's desire and wish. So how come the words al pi Hashem only apply to going out from their starting points to their journeys? But when they're going from their journeys to their starting point, what does that even mean? And why is it not al pi Hashem? With that, he says, I hold there are three ways to look at it. I'm going to give you three ways to look at it. The first one is like this. So some of the journeys are headed or they're walking in a forward direction. And some of the journeys, they're actually going in a reverse, a backwards direction. See, in the very beginning, we're going to compare, um, actually, when it says in the beginning, he's taking us back to Exodus chapter 14, verse 2. He's going to give us three examples where we walked backwards. Okay, look at number 6 on the source sheet, Exodus 14, 2. Right, speak to the children of Israel and let them turn back. Okay. And encamp in front of Pihachirot. So in the Hebrew is the Yeshuvu Yachanu. Let them return and go back to, to encamp in this particular place. Rashi says right away, to their rear, meaning they went backwards in the backwards direction. Another example he brings, well, actually, just read Rashi, Shahakulachareim Litsad Mitzrayim. They went backward in the direction of Egypt. V'chein b'parshas devarim. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 1, it says over there, V'nathen v'nisa hamidbara. Right? And then we turned and journeyed in the direction of the desert. Okay, now Rashi actually says there, very interesting, um, because they sinned. Because they sinned. Rashi said, had they not sinned, they would have gone all the way towards the land of Israel towards the southern end, but it, because they sinned, it was decreed upon them, they remained in the desert. So they ended up turning towards the desert. So the Kliakar says, Perush Rashi, Lefi shekilkalu hafchu litzad hamidbar. Because of kilkul. Kilkul, I would translate as sin, but it means a, a, um, a damage, 
a spoiling, a corruption, a disgrace, a perversion. That you can use all those words, but it's because of sin, because of chet. Okay? Now, um, and then there's a third example he brings, and that's from in Parshas Ekev, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 6. Now, even here, you wouldn't know it from the verse, but only from Rashi, but after you understood what the Sukkim are talking about, you would understand Rashi is correct. It says in 10.6, in Deuteronomy, <coughs> the children of Israel journeyed from the wells of Bnei Yakan to Maserah. There Aaron died. And there he was buried, and Eliez, Eleazar, his son, Eliezer's son, served as Cohen in his stead. I'm sorry, Eleazar. So what do you have in Rashi? Rashi mentions over there that this was like a continuation of Deuteronomy 1.1. Deuteronomy begins with rebuke. Moses lists all these different places that we were at and things we did wrong. He did it in a hinting fashion. But it was all part of his rebuke. rebuke. I have it... Um, uh, underlined in the middle, if you actually calculate it, you'll find eight stations from Misarot to Mount Hor. Hor. However, the answer is, this is also part of the rebuke introduced, introduced in Deuteronomy 1.1, and it's continued here. Um, okay, so basically the clouds of glory went away when Aaron died, and uh, the, Jew the Jewish people were afraid of an impending war and they appointed a leader to go back to Egypt, which again, that itself could be considered a sin, okay, when you have such fear and not relying on Hashem. Okay, so let's continue where we left off. We just gave three verses, <coughs> three proofs where they went backwards. So some go forward, some go backward. So... Uh, Rashi continues, um, the clear card continues, Shechazru Shmonim Maso Lachareim, like we saw in Rashi, that they went back eight stages, eight encampments. Now, Nimsa means, so what comes out? What do we see from all this? Sharov Hamasos, for sure, a majority of their travels, Asher Haluchu Behem Lefanim Velo Lachor, they certainly went in a forward direction and not backwards, and that was Al Pi Hashem. Remember that part of the verse where it says from their going out towards their um, travels, that means in a forward direction, and that's al pi Hashem, and that's nikrim motsoyehem lemasayem, from their going out to their travels. And you know why? Ki hafchu peneyem min hamakom asher yatsu misham, because they turned their faces away from the place they were leaving. And that's called from you're going out. Okay, that's Nikra Motsayehem. And the Penehem El Masayem, whereas their faces were towards their journeys, Asher Hayulifnehem, which was in front of them. That all makes sense. Aval, but Mashin Nazru Achor, whatever, they went backwards. Remember, we saw already three places where they traveled backwards towards Egypt. That was Bafor Shekilkulu Bechet. That's because of, we say, the sin. They damaged themselves through sin. It's the sin itself that was lo hayal pi Hashem. Obviously, their travels, they only traveled al pi Hashem. But the sin itself is not according to what God's will is. And that's why al pi Hashem does not appear when it says they traveled backwards. And therefore, we would call that ma'asayim lemosayim. They traveled towards their starting point. That they returned and traveled to the very place that they had just left from, or they had left recently. That means the part of the place of departure. Again, because they wanted to face or go back in the direction of Egypt, which is also itself a sin. Okay, so let's begin Perish Hashemi. The second um, description of what's going on here, according to the Kliyakar, a uh, second way to look at it is Kishinit Dak Dek. When you really carefully examine. Maush in Emar, we're going to go from verse 3 and verse 5 and carefully examine what it says. In verse 3, take a look. Where do you find this? Uh, number 9. In number 9, you have verse 3 and verse 5. 
It says they journeyed from Ramses in the first month. Ve'yisu me Ramses bechodesh harishon. It doesn't say who. They is inferred in the word ve'yisu, right? Ve'yisu they traveled, they journeyed. Now later on in verse five, it literally says the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses. It actually says ve'yisu b'nei Yisrael me Ramses. Why would you have? Who are they? I mean, if it's they are referring to the Jewish people, why repeat it in verse 5? It's like, not like in Deuteronomy or in Exodus and we're dealing with numbers. We're talking about one verse after another. And you have they traveled from Ramses and then you have B'nai Israel traveled from Ramses. Would you believe we're talking about two different groups of people? It could, could you swallow that idea? Wait till you hear what the clear cards to say. <clears throat> And he mentions right away, Velo Hiskir B'nai Yisrael. Right in verse 3, it doesn't say it's the Jewish people, it's just whoever they are. However, in verse 5, it comes and repeats a second time, almost word for word, except that it's the Jewish people. The Yisu B'nai Yisrael Ramses. So what's going on here? That's going to be the first question. That's a good question. So if we stop now, you're not going to sleep tonight. No. <coughs> And then he says, V'od kasiv hacha, also written here in our Parsha, in verse 3, it says, Mimacharat ha-Pesach yatsu b'nei Israel. See, I have it uh, highlighted and underlined as well. On the day following the Passover sacrifice, well, the rest of the verses, the children of Israel left the Yad Ramah, they left very triumphantly, their hands held up high, their he heads held up high, but basically they went out during the day. As it says, on the day following the Pesach. Well, if in our, in our chapter it says they went out during the day. Clear as mud. However, he brings down a verse that says like this. It's in Deuteronomy chapter um, 16, verse 1. Okay, it says, Hotzi Acha Hashem Mimitzrayim Laila. Actually, it says, Hotzi Hashem Elkecha Mimitzrayim Laila, which means the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt. When? What does it say? Laila. Laila means at night. So when did we leave? Did we leave during the day, like it says in our Parsha? Or did we leave at night, like it says over there? Well, we have to, we have to move on, or else we're not going to sleep tonight. I like my sleep. So the clear card begins by saying, Elavadai, with absolute certainty. Uh, guys ever heard of what the heir of Rav? The heir of Rav are the mixed multitudes. Interestingly enough, let me just give you some background. Moses on his own decided these souls have potential. They're Egyptian nationals. And they should come along if they want to come along. And he took them along. Never had a discussion with Hashem, and I don't think he even asked us. And the truth is, they were the biggest troublemakers and agitators. We have a few other adjectives, but truth be told, they did convert, and they're, they're mixed in with us. However, they were also twice the size, in, you know, in, in amount, kamut, than we were. We went through this uh, according to the minimum opinion. Uh, one opinion says it was 1.2 million, another says there were 2.4 million, and another third opinion is 3.6 million. That's a lot, because that's only the age of 20 to 60 of males. So you're talking about the same, if we were 3 million, they were 6 million, minimally. Okay, so it's the Erev Rav, Halchu Balayla Derech Bericha. The way the clear card is explaining it, which many before she explained it this way, who left at night? The heir of Rav. They left at night. We left with our heads held up high in the middle of the day in front of the eyes of the Egyptians, as the verse says so clearly. It was Alehem Neemar, and that is referring to in Exodus chapter 14, verse 5. I want to mention something else about the heir of Rav. The, the clear card brings it down, but it's from a mechilta. Any time that the word ha'am is used, ha'am means the people, it's always referring to the Erev Rav. Or the most inferior or evil of the Jews. Okay, so ha'am. So look what it says in verse, uh, uh, Exodus 14, verse 5. It was reported to Pharaoh that the people had fled. 
okay? The people had fled. So what is the word bar, Borach and Boreach? Listen to what it says. It says in, uh, in Exodus 14.5, V'yugad lemelech Mitzrayim, right? His servants or his ministers, uh, the officers came and told him, told Pharaoh, ki barach ha'am, that the people had fled. It's the word ha'am is used. The word barach is used. Borach is not used. Borach is present tense. Ele borach. Shekvar barach miyad b'tseisam. Meaning that they left as soon as they were free. Hafaro actually said, you guys are free. Get the heck out of here. There's no question, right? He got up in his pajamas in the middle of the night and he said, you're out of here. I mean, but we didn't leave until the next day. But who did leave that night? The heir of Rav. Because they, they really didn't have much merit. And therefore, why wait around? If he said, we're free, we're out of here. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's what they did. They left immediately in the middle of the night. You cannot justify to talk about the Jews like this. The verse actually says they went out triumphantly. That's biyad rama means with their hands held up high. And it also says le'ene in front of the eyes of the Egyptians. So Elavadai with absolute certainty, Sha'al Ha'er of Rav Hugulo, that when the when Pharaoh was told by his servants, it was referring to the heir of Rav, that they had they had left in the middle of the night. Shinik Rubishem Am, they are the ones called Am. Aval Yisrael, when it comes to the children of Israel, Hachobiyom Biyad Rama, they went out during the day. As it says, go back to verse 3. It says, The Yusumi Ramzis Bechodesh Harishon. Right? They journeyed from Ramzis in the first month. Okay, we know that is the night of the 15th on the first month. Be'erav Rav Hu Medaber. That part of the verse is definitely speaking about the Erev Rav. However, in the same verse towards the end, it says, it says Mimacharat. Hapesach Yatsu Ben Israel Biad Rama. See, in the same verse, it refers to the Jewish people as, and it says that, uh, on the following day the, of the Passover sacrifice, it was the children of Israel that left triumphantly. Now go back and now go towards verse 5, where it specifically mentions that the Jewish people traveled from, from Ramses, the Yusuf Ben Israel, the Ramses. It's got to be the Jewish people. Why? <coughs> because the Erev had already left. They already went out originally like the way of people who are fleeing. <coughs> when you flee, you're in a rush. You want to get out as soon as quick, as soon as possible. <coughs> Where the Jewish people went patiently afterwards. And that's what it means now we go back to our verse, in verse 2, it says, V'yikta Moshe as y'motzayeyim l'maseim api Hashem. Right, we were confused by this idea that they went out from their starting point to their journeys, api Hashem. We weren't confused really about that, but with the second part, it caused some confusion. Well, this part is Nisiyas B'nei Shah. That is clearly talking about the Jewish people. Asher uh, Yosadam. This is a fundamental idea the yesod, the fundamental makeup of the Jewish people, and I'm talking physically and spiritually, and perhaps more spiritually than physically. The makeup is from the land of, of Israel, from the Holy Land. Let me just go back to the beginning of creation when Hashem created man. The, the Medrash explains that he took soil from all parts of the globe and he brought that soil to the Temple Mount, we call the Evan Ashtia, the foundation stone, and he created man from there, on there, not from there, but yes, because he also took soil from there too, and he used that for the head. The head, the head obviously represents the spiritual intellect, as well as the leader, and that is the Jewish people. That's why we have this connection, this strong connection to the land of Israel. 
Because like Lech Lecha, Avraham was told by God, go to yourself. Go to from where you were hewn from. Now, I say hewn in terms of like, you know, you have like a quarry and you, you hewn rocks. So there is a physical aspect to hewn. But I think we're really referring to the soul. The soul was hewn from Jerusalem above, from that, that I don't know what they say in modern quantum physics, you know, a vortex or some kind of a, an opening to the, the other world. But this is the ladder to heaven, to, right to God, right where Hashem created us from. In fact, it says in the Rambam that where does my own, where does man find his atonement? He uses some very interesting language. He says, man will find his atonement in the very place which he was created from. Now that obviously has many layers of meaning. We're talking about from Hashem himself. But from a physical place, that's where the altar is. The altar is in that place where man was created, and that's where he'll find his atonement. But obviously it means a lot more than that. Okay, so he says here, Asher Yesod Meir Kadosha. Why are we traveling? We're traveling. The Jewish people, Israel, is traveling to Israel because that is the Yesodam. That is the fun fundamental makeup of who we are from the Holy Land. Al Kain Hafchu Tami Pnehem Min Motsoyehem. That's why our faces were always turned away from the place we were leaving. Let's call that Egypt. Hamakam Asher Yotzumisham, the place where we left from. Mimitzrayim, obviously that's Egypt. Megamat Panehem Lamasayim. And always their faces are going to be to their travels. And where is that? Lavo El Haaretz Asher Nishba Hashem Lavotam. To come and to arrive, to go to the land which Hashem had promised their forefathers. That's all true by Israel. Aval Ha'erivrav, but when it came to the Erivrav, where did I tell you their makor, their source was? Egypt. So they're always going to be looking backwards. I can't make this up. This is tremendous here. Aval Ha'erivrav, Shayu Makura Mi Mitzrayim. Their very source is Egypt itself. From Egypt, and they never left Egypt they left because Moses on his own decided they were going to come along believe me they had potential many of them probably became very righteous people Moses on his own even when we sin with the golden calf God says it's your people when God says it's your people to Moses your people have sinned the word Ha'am is used. He's not referring to B'nai Israel. Obviously, there were 3,000 Jews that did. But, never, and we're all responsible. But it was, the, it was the Erev Rav that instigated it. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And where they came up with this whole idea. So, now we understand Nehemar Behem regarding them, the Erev Rav. That's the latter part of verse 3, where it says, Elu Maseim Lemotzayayim. These are their journeys from their start to the start to their starting points because they're always going back to Egypt. They said, "Appoint us ahead, and we're going to go back to Egypt." We remember the free fish, the garlics, and the watermelon, and the leeks. You know, you name it. Ki tamid hayalem chayfitz v'ratzon l'shuv l'mitzrayim l'mekoram because it was constantly their desire and will to return back to Egypt which is their makor, their source. And then there's a, there's a uh, Midrash Tanchuma. Um, it's a little bit out of context, but in look, look at number 13. Um, so it says, basically, when you throw a stick in the air, where does the stick come to? It comes back to its original place, meaning the ground, right? So the same thing. It's, we'll call it a natural consequence. The Jews will return, they want to return, it's in the DNA to return, it's in the consciousness to return. Of course, there's a lot of hesitation and, um, I forget the word I'm looking for, but resistance. Tremendous amount of resistance, but that is the direction, and when that resistance is removed, they'll come quite willingly. That's the way it is. You're always going to go in the direction of where you came from. Okay, so that is the second explanation. 
Okay, and the third explanation, Perush Hashlishi Hu. The third explanation is Shimalelo Chotu Yisrael. If the Jewish people had never sinned, and I recall Larry mentioning this, Hayunoisim Benesia Achas Laaretz. We would have basically come pretty much straight away, right? We would have just made one long, maybe 11 days journey from Kharev. There's different opinions, but we would have basically wouldn't have had 40 years. Within a year, probably within a year and a half, we would have been there to Israel. Maybe we would have only stopped at um, Mount Sinai. So we have this statement, the Yiktu Moshe et Motsoyeim Lamaseim, right? The very first part of verse 2 was Moses wrote from their goings out to their uh, journeys. Kimin Yitzir Rishona, Loyalem Od Yitzir Mimakum Chania. That would have been from, would have been from their first exit, there would have not been to them any other places to leave from. Kirotz Hashem Lisosam Al Kanthe Nisharim. If you look in Exodus chapter 19, verse 4, which I believe, I believe is number 12. Um, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. This is right before uh, this, the, um, the giving of the, the Ten Commandments. This is uh, during the, um, after the splitting of the sea. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings, and I brought you to me. So what does this verse mean? It's a very interesting Rashi. Um, basically, when we were in Egypt, we were in many places, albeit, let's say, near Goshen, but nevertheless, Hashem took us, we were scattered through Goshen, He took us in a very short period of time, we were able to, to get out when we did leave, um, so this was done, let's say, miraculously, like, like um, being born on eagle's wings. Look at uh, the latter part of the Rashi where it says on eagle's wings, like an eagle. Now we looked this up, thanks to Simon. Uh, he's not actually here right now. But uh, it's not only eagles, but there are other strong birds that do this. Many birds do not. They carry their young on its wings. What all other birds do is they usually place their young between their feet because they're afraid of the, the birds flying high would then swoop down and they don't even see them coming and take their young. But since eagles fly very high, they're not at all concerned about any other birds flying higher. Now, they are concerned though about archers. You wonder how an eagle can know, maybe they've seen it happen. But archers, people with bows and arrows, do take out eagles, eagles right? So basically they're protecting, they have no fear of anything above, but they do have fear of things below coming at them. So it says like this, the eagle, however, fears only man, lest he shoot an arrow at it, because no other bird flies above it. Therefore, what he does, he places them on its wings. And as it says, um, I don't know where it says it, it says in Exodus 14, uh, verse, verse 19 and 20. See, we were in 19.4. But if you go to verses 19 and 20, it mentions, rather the arrow pierced me and not my children. Um, I think that's maybe the Milchilta. But then it's based on the verse. Um, the, then the angel of God moved and he came between the camp, right? That the, the angel, or let's say even the fire and, and the, the clouds, basically were protecting us from the Egyptians as the Egyptians shot arrows and catapult stones, the clouds of glory basically absorbed them, meaning ke'ilu as if, kaviachal Hashem, placed himself between us and the ammunition that was being fired at us. So that was, that's what it means. Um, but in another sense, what Klikar is saying is this is also referring to Hashem's willingness from the very beginning as he gathered us all over Goshen miraculously to bring us to one place so we can all leave together, so too he was ready and willing to bring us straight into Eretz Yisrael. And that's what I believe he's saying here. But because 
and he says, "Laaretz miad." We would have ended up in the in the land of Israel immediately, but because of our sin, But it was only because of our sin. Referring even when we talked about the erevav, this was referring to the erevav in the previous pesa, uh, pa- paragraph. Any time that word the words ha'am is used or refer to the erevav, it can also just as well be speaking about Jews who are sinners and evil. That's why it says, These are their travels to their starting, starting points. Shinasu el Misham. Meaning, they traveled to the places that in the end they were going to go back to, and leave from there. Liot mitutalim mimasa lamasa. In other words, to be movables basically going from one journey to another. Had we gone straight into Israel, there wouldn't have been all these journeys. But now because of our sin, we're going sometimes backwards, some, right? and therefore we're moving around, not in a total haphazard way, but in the way that it says, even going backwards. V'zedavar lo'ayal p'yashem, and again, those travels were not a p'yashem because of the sin, Hashem never wanted them. What he wanted and desired was to bring us immediately straight into Eretz Israel. And now we think back on that first Rashi. What are all these ma'asot about? Ultimately, it's about the chesed of Hashem. Because there's a lot of depth to that. Even when we sin, Hashem is the forgiver. He, he, he loves us. And he gives us chance after chance after chance. And this is really a plug for the series I'm giving on the uh, Tomer Devora, where we talk about the 13 attributes of mercy, that when we imitate Hashem, but this is what God wants, He created us in His image, when we actually imitate Him, we draw down into the world these, these um, attributes from Hashem. So in other words, we kick it off, we initiate it by our actions, we draw forth His actions, these are called like ideas of his mercy and his forgiveness that we bring this into the world. And it's an amazing thing. And you'll feel it. It's like substance. It's, it's existence. And I also encourage people to listen to Rabbi Kesson. He spoke um, last night. So you look at it. It's called the divine in-depth, uh, in the in-depth look at the divine plan. So... Hopefully we'll uh, all learn something, we'll all grow, go through our journeys, not alone, but together. And Bezrat uh, Hashem, we'll all grow and see Mashiach soon. And this year, hopefully, it'll be the last time we observe Tisha B'Av the way we are accustomed to. And as Larry said earlier, it is called a Moed. Bezrat Hashem, this should be the last time, or not even yet, it won't even happen. Um, and I wish everyone a Chodesh Tov, Shabbat Shalom and a great life. We'll see you next week.